Good morning, everybody. I can see you out there. I'd like to start with a, <coughs> a quote from Daphne Collier. So if this is um, so great, our university is now obsolete. Well, Mark Twain certainly thought so. He said the college is a place where a professor's lecture notes go straight to a student's lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> I beg to differ with Mark Twain, though. I think what he was complaining about is not, is not universities, but rather the lecture-based format that so many universities spend so much time on. So let's go from back even further to Plutarch, who said that the mind is not a vessel that needs filling, but wood that needs igniting. And maybe we should spend less time at universities filling our students' minds with content by lecturing at them, and more time igniting their creativity, their imagination, and their problem-solving skills by actually talking with them. So how do we do that? Exactly. How do we do that? And, and what we're experiencing currently in education is we're re rethinking how we do that. We, we, we can't just sit and lecture at our students. And I'm going to use the word learners. That implies students, clients, whoever comes through our door. Um, so how do we do that? We, things are, dif are different. And we need, to, we need to consider this, particularly in the relation to technology. Now, that was Daphne Collier. Um, and by the way, uh, the resources link that you've got, uh, that I've given you, Paige, has the links to all the different research and articles I talk about in this keynote and also in my workshop, so you've got all the information there. But Daphne is one of the people responsible for starting Coursera, which was one of the first online learning platforms that happened in post-secondary education that really led to the whole MOOC movement, massive open online content. Now, Daphne, that's a TED talk. Do you know? Do you, so just keep nodding. Uh, can you put your mobile phones to your face so I can see you nodding? Because I can't see anybody. Um, now, it's a TED talk. Now, what happens, um, talking about mobile technology, uh, I need to share with you that uh, my wife and I both have iPads, and we often lie in bed together with our iPads. You're getting a, a mental picture, and, and she's watching um, um, uh, iView because she missed out on Rake, missed that episode of Rake, because she's a teacher and didn't get to that. And I'm watching, I'm doing, I'm reading the paper, and occasionally on Gmail I'll send a little chat saying, what are you wearing? To which she often punches me. But anyway, I'm probably giving you far too much information now. And we stalk our kids, too. We stalk our children on our mobile devices. Our, my children are 23 and 26, and we both stalk... Our son has disappeared. He realised we were stalking him. Um, he's gone somewhere else. I think he goes to coffee shops and actually meets people face to face, which is kind of a revolutionary thing. But we stalk our daughter and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and, I, and um, I do watch TED Talks, and TED Talks are, are wonderful. If you, go to, if you just Google TED, they're 19-minute inspirational talks. And Daphne does this great talk about where are we going in terms of how we deliver instruction to learners in post-school environments, such as TAFE colleges. So it's an issue for us, uh, that how we're going to do this. Um, the, the other issue for us is that, the, is that the students that we, the learners that we work with, are in this cohort. The International um, Adult Literacy Survey that happens across developed countries. Currently in Australia, uh, the stats indicate that 44% of Australians are, are essentially functionally illiterate. They are functioning below level three, and a bit at level three means that you need to have the literacy skills required to fully operate in our society, our digital society, to be both in employment, to be socially connected, and in terms of your health. There's a direct correlation between literacy and health. And it's not saying that 44% of people can't read, it's saying that 44% of people, their literacy is such that they can't actually reach that glass ceiling. And that includes the students that you, that you work with. Um, students who struggle because English, the primary mode of instruction, is not their first language. And that's a huge number. And so, so there's this idea that education is changing and this idea that we actually have these students who struggle um, as a result of the, 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 the education that we provide them and how do we go, how do we go around to, um, to address this. Now, I, um, I have my own selfies that I do 
and there's a selfie to with a group. And so, and so my name's Greg, and I'm, a, I'm a, a teacher, I'm an educator, I'm a learner. Um, I've been an administrator, uh, um, a school executive, but I share with you one thing, and it's in my teaching career, I've worked in a job where I make a difference. The learners that come through the door of my classroom, of my programs, experience needs, a struggle with the way that traditionally we've actually taught those young people or those, those learners. And I can do things in my job that makes a difference. How cool is that? And you do the same thing. We, and I share that with you, that we actually make a difference. When we go to work, we can do one small thing that we don't even anticipate can make a huge difference to someone's life. And today, on this little journey we're going to go on using mobile technology, I want to explore with you how you can make a difference using technology. And it can just be one small thing that you don't even anticipate that you can do. Now, um, on, the, on the today's meet, I've put this link, and there it is again, and I'll bring it back at the end, um, that you'll find this presentation, my workshop presentations today, and my workshops today will be an extension, will be drilling down the information I'm covering in this keynote, and also some notes for you as well. So, so Daphne says education is changing. How do we do that? Our learners are coming to us with a variety of diverse learning needs. How do we do that? And that's your job. And the first thing we have to realise is that literacy today has changed. So as I'm lying in bed with Cherie, oops, I told you her name, and um, so how do you figure I do my banking when I'm lying in bed with my mobile device? Where do I do my banking? Online. Uh, where, do I do, where do I do my shopping sometimes on, on, online? Um, how do my kids find out where the party is on Saturday night? Facebook, social media. What does it all require me or my, my kids to be able to do? It requires me to be able to read and to be able to write. Cathy Schrock talks about there are now 13 literacies we need to engage with our learners in education. It's just not reading and writing as we traditionally know that there are a whole bunch of literacies we need to teach the learners that we, that we work with. For instance, the, the use of video as an instructional tool, we need to teach people how to use video as an instructional learning tool. How do you watch a video? How do you watch it, take notes and get information from that? That's just one example. How do you teach your, your learners to look at a URL address and realise whether it's a safe or an unsafe place to go? How can you decode those addresses to know more information? These are all literacies we need to be, to be aware of. So we've got this kind of issue, and, and, and one of the things that we have is um, it's bewildering, t digital technology. You kind of go, ah. Oh. So I've just updated to iOS 8, and all of a sudden half my apps don't work. And I've got to, up, and I've got to update. And, so it's a building, and if I'm an administrator, which, you, which are in the room, how do, I, how do I plan for this? How do I do this? There's a couple of tools that can actually kind of point us in the right direction. One of them is, is the New Horizons report. It's an annual report that's a global report that calls upon the expertise of a whole range of experts and research projects that tells us where we're going in education in terms of technology. What are the trends? What are the challenges? And what are the technologies that are kind of affording us the ability to make a difference with, this, with the learners that we work with? So currently we know in, in education, both school and post-school, as in TAFE, trends are things like online learning. We're moving to an online learning environment. You don't actually need to be in the building. There are, there are students in America who are outsourcing their homework to people in India. You don't need to be in the building. We, we know that, um, we know that we, there are some significant challenges for us. And one of them in post-secondary education is the low digital literacy, literacy and use of the people in the system. How do we use this stuff? Oh well, my God, you give me an iPad? I, how do I, I don't use technology. Oh, no, no. Um, I, I, don't, I don't do that. I, uh, uh, a TAFE uh, program in New South Wales... Uh, a, a tape teacher in automotive was delivering some instruction in the classroom. This is, uh, I won't tell you where this was happening. He was writing on a whiteboard for his students. 
uh, for his learners. The learners were sit had to take notes from the whiteboard. One of the learners pulls out a mobile phone because he can't take notes in that manner and attempts to take a photo of the teacher's whiteboard. The teacher swings around and says, stop, you mobile phones are banned from my classroom. That's my intellectual property. You can't take a photo of that. That indicated to me a couple of things. Is What it indicated was uh, he actually was being totally disrupted by this technology. He was unsure what it meant. And the best way to do when you're unsure about what something means, if it's disrupting you, if you're actually unsure how to use it, is you can just, I'll just ban it. I'll just take it away. And, we, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But that's an issue that we need, we need to address. And the other thing that, that's coming, important developments, is the whole BYOD in cloud computing. BYOD stands bring, bring your own device. It's really about how powerful it is that when a learner comes to any learning environment and not be given their special bit of equipment, but they bring their device that is set up for them, ready for them, controlled by them, in their hands. And when, and when, when their learning material is in the cloud, it's no longer located on a, on a PC, it's actually somewhere that they're accessible the whole time. If you're in administration and you're currently buying, buying blue Cat5 cable for your, lap, for your desktop computers to plug into the internet, you're kind of wasting your money because desktop computers are really something that actually is, is, is going away. Mobile technology is what's happening, whether we like it or not, but it actually affords so many powerful things for the, for the learners that, that we're working with. And, and, and so we could embrace this stuff, you know, fantastic. But you've got to be careful about the geek. Beware the geek. You know, the shiny object syndrome person. You know, oh, I've got my new iPad. Oh, iOS 8. Oh, and you hug it, you know. Oh, I've got a new cover. It's red. Oh, yours is blue. That's beautiful. Oh, I've got a 128. You know, all that kind of stuff where you actually just become, you become like Gollum with the ring. You just want to actually have this thing. <laughs> And we, need, and we need to be careful because we know that, that technology actually goes through cycles and we need, we need to be aware. And the Gartner hype cycle is actually a research-based cycle and it actually looks more like a wiggly line than a cycle. But it talks about what happens when, you actually, when new technology is introduced. The first thing that actually happens is we have this peak of inflated expectation. Oh, my God, 3D printing. It's gonna, we're going to be able to print everything. Or, Google Glasses, we all need to be walking around with a pair of Google Glasses. How cool is that? And we know that eventually, whatever technology is introduced, it will actually go and delve itself into the trough of disillusionment. It is always followed by that. And then eventually, it gets to a peak of productivity where things smooth out and we actually realise that we can actually use this technology. And this happens over a period of time. I think it's a bit like marriage in some ways. <laughs> Lying in bed with my iPhones. Maybe me, me sitting, what are you wearing, is now a kind of trough of disillusionment. That's probably where I'm at. No, it's not true. This has been recorded, so she'll see that. That's a problem. Um, so, so things like currently, currently we know that things like wearable technology is there. It's not to say it's bad, but it's, it's, we need to embrace it. We need to realise we need to figure out how to use this. How is it going to be beneficial to our learners? We have to realise that... ICT, Information Communication Technology, stands for not ICT, Information Communication Technology, but it can't teach. <laughs> so just by putting a pair of Google Glasses on someone's head, it's not going to teach them to read or to write. It's a tool that we need to use for our teaching and learning. We need to figure out how we're going to use that. And we, we need to realise that eventually things are going to fall over sometimes. So, for instance, cloud-based computing is now according to the research in that trough. And things like the whole naked photos on Instagram and Twitter is a pro... Everyone's going, see, told you, cloud computing, nothing's safe. They're going to hack. You know that um, in terms of stalking our kids on Facebook, uh, currently the biggest uptakers of Facebook are women between the ages of 45 and 55, probably all stalking their children, on, um, <laughs> of which half, 40% of those people who sign up never use the account because you're afraid that someone's going to know where you live and come around and take photos of you or steal your account. And that's where, that's that, trough, you know, I don't know how to use this stuff, so I need to ban it. And then we, we do know that eventually this technology has a really important place. So, for, for instance, currently, speech recognition technology has advanced to a level now where it actually is at a level where it's totally functional. That for some of the learners that you work with, 
is going to be a tool that can revolutionise the way that they both interact with the technology and, and, and write. So we know this is happening. So, so that thing about ICT, that's true. And the work of John Hattie, uh, he has this wonderful quote, the brain does not come with any specific programs that enable information to leap off the screen into your head. So mobile technology is really important. But just by putting an iPad in front of a, a learner is not, going to f is, is not going to do it. We need to do more. We need to think about how we use this how we use this technology. But the thing that I do know is that currently we're at an event horizon. I've been teaching and using technology since... I've been teaching since 1980 and using technology since 1980. But in the last couple of years, really, I think technology has changed to the extent that we can actually really meaningfully use it, particularly in my area, which is looking at using inclusive technologies, technologies that support diverse learners, those learners that come into your, through your door that actually struggle because of the way instruction is delivered, they struggle because of their reading and writing, and we need to give them tools that actually remove those struggles. We need to see the possibilities that, that, that those people have when they come into our programs. And it's, just, it's so important, we actually need to have a plan about how to use this technology because I don't think it's any, any longer the case that we, we might use it, it's now an essential tool. If we don't provide it, we're actually doing a disservice to all the learners that we have in our programs. And it's dangerous to say to yourself, well, we've always done it this way, that's the way, you know, I've always written my notes on the whiteboard and get my students to write them down. Well, we, re -need, we need to rethink that. We need to challenge those assumptions because I know there can be a different way. We need to try another way. We need to look at the possibilities. And what happens is that, that it, there is an issue as you as individuals and the system that you work in tend to push back. Michael Fullan, who's an educationalist around, who works particularly around the area of change, talks about inevitable dangers. Technology is an inevitable danger. It is not going to go away. Social media is an inevitable danger. It is not going to go away. And rather than run away and hide, we need to move towards it to figure out how we're going to use this for the needs of the, of the learners that we work with. And so what I want to do is do that, jump in. And so at the beginning of the, my first slide had these had this image, and this is a library where the books are actually chained to the, into the library. And that's the, way that, that's the way that lots of the learners that we work with see their learning material as books that are locked that they can't access because those books are inaccessible, those books are in a language that is not their first or second language in some cases, and those books that are actually seen as, as, a, a, as a, private, a private place that they don't often inhabit. So let's, let's think about how we can actually unlock those books and, and why do we need to do that? And I just wanted to kind of um, just uh, mention a second TED talk. If you did nothing else from coming to my session but to watch this particular TED talk, I would feel that I've actually made a difference. This is by a guy called Todd Rose and, and Todd has a TED talk called The Myth of Average and he talks about, um, he talks about um, the... United, United States Air Force after the war and they um, were after the Second World War. There's so many wars now, we don't know which one we're talking about. Um, and up, they decided to invest lots of money into their fighter jets. And they, they actually uh, employed this company to, to make these jets. They had, the, the, they had a bucket of money, they had the best pilots and had a wonderful technology. So the company designed these jets and they bought them, and they were test, test flying them and they just didn't work. And they couldn't figure out. And they went back to the company. They said, well, we, we're spending all this money. We've got the best jets. We've got the best technology. But this, the, the pilots get in and they just can't control these things. And the company said, well, what we're doing is we're designing these cockpits for the planes for the average pilot. We've done a, a, a profile of what pilots should be. And we've actually desi designed it for the average pilot. And, um, and the Air Force said, oh, oh. They went back and, and reviewed their pilot pool. And you know how many pilots in their pilot pool actually fitted an average profile? None. They were designing the cockpit for nobody. The Air Force went back to the manufacturer and said, we need to ban the average. We want you to design these cockpits to the edges for all our pilots. The, the, the company said, no, no, too expensive. Air Force said, we won't buy your airplanes. The company said, OK, we found a way of doing it. And they have actually produced 
adjustable seats, for instance, in the cockpits, made a cockpit that was for everybody, and all of a sudden they were able to extend their talent pool and made these planes available. And it reminded me of my first car, which was a combi, which was a one-size-fits-all. And not adjustable seat, a bench seat, for instance, so um, as Sri was driving, I could snuggle up and she could cuddle me as we drove along because I couldn't drive because my little legs couldn't actually reach the pedals because I couldn't <laughs> make the adjustment. Just to prove that that's actually me and my car, that's how I looked back then <laughs> in my first combi. And, um, and, and as a result of the, of the Air Force banning the average and designing the edges, when you get into your car today, that seat you're sitting in is a direct result of that process. Now, you know where I'm going with this? I'm going with this into the classroom. We design our classrooms as a one-size-fits-all. It's a, a place where we provide the same material in the same way to all our students. And even the environment, even the seating, even the way we access information is a one-size-fits-all fits environment. So do we actually need adjustable seating for our learners, particularly those learners who, who have English as not their first language, who struggle with the way that they actually access the learning and teaching of whatever environment they're in. And when they go into our, into our learning programs, we give them textbooks or we give them websites or we give them material to read. They might be in a, in a hospitality program, they might be in an automotive program, they might be whatever. What are those books designed for? When you go into a science program, be it in year nine in a high school, or be it in a, you're doing a science in, in TAFE, whatever it's doing, are you actually doing science to learn science, or are you learning to read science? And when you've actually completed your, your program, are you being assessed on what you know about science, or are you being assessed on your ability to write about science? And we need to rethink the way that we provide this instructional material for our students, because currently, it impacts upon their learning. It impacts upon our, how our learners access the learning material, how they participate, and how they progress through. When you think about it, you know, uh, that guy with the whiteboard, he was really doing a one-size-fits-all. These are my notes. Everyone takes, takes them down the same way, ban the phone. And it, it, kind, of, you know, it kind of made me think, I, this is me with another selfie with my mate Kevin Honeycutt, and we were um, name-dropping. I was in America, and I was at the Apollo 13 exhibition. And, uh, you know, that's the one that Tom Hanks saved. <laughs> and, um, and it was about, you know, the, and it was about uh, that I was really inspired. Here we are. That's a kind of a man, kind of macho thing. Here we are doing a thing. But I found these um, bracelets, and I'm wearing one today. And it says, failure is not an option. And I share with you the thing that we actually make a difference. But I want to share with you that, that, that actually that also means that failure should not be an option for any of our learners because no longer should our learners be defined by their ability to read and write. I'm going to do to today and in my workshops talk about the fact that my ability to read and write should no longer define me because I can do other things. I can get provisions, I can have accommodations and adjustments, compensatory tools that when I go into a program, I'm not being, it's not about learning to read about the program, it's actually getting involved and engaged in what I'm doing, my learning, and when I want to do an assessment, it's not about my ability to use pen and paper to write down what I know, but it's how I can actually tell you, not only what I know, but what I feel and what I'm passionate about. So, let's explore that, and, and it'll come up with things like fairness. Oh, we can't do this, everyone has to do the same thing. Well, you know, fairness is not about all doing it. Equity is not equal. Equity is about giving people what they need. And we need to get over the fact that we all have to have the level playing field. It's about, getting, it's about giving our learners what they need. It's also about asking questions. So, for instance, why am I still using this keyboard? This keyboard was invented in 1860 when the typewriter was invented because when they invented the typewriter, which was a really cool technology invention, it allowed people to actually produce text really quickly. Is he spitting everywhere? Um, but when they first actually invented the keyboard, they put all the commonly occurring keys together, and so people could type really fast, and it jammed the, the arms on the, on the keyboard. So they invented the QWERTY keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, to slow the typist down. That keyboard is intended to, re, to 
move the keys apart and slow you down. Why are we still using it on devices that we no longer can jam? Why do we insist that the only way you type is to do a touch typing course? Why don't we use the Dvorak keyboard, a much better keyboard to use? Is it because Mavis Beacon has, a, has a, some kind of hold over the whole thing? And so, it, so it's no longer the ability to be defined by our ability to read and write and to use a QWERTY keyboard. We need to be defined by the things that we can do. And, and we, need to do, we need to immerse ourselves in the possibilities. When someone walks into my classroom, I want to see their diversity as a possibility that I embrace, not a problem I have to get over and apply for funding for. And that's currently how we deal with, with diversity. We see it as a barrier, that the, a deficit model that that person brings to my environment and they need to get over it. Well, no, no, the deficit is with me. I need to find out how I can actually embrace the possibilities that exist and what I suggest to you is that technology, whilst it is not the only thing, it's an essential component. We can do things now with technology we've never been able to do before, but we actually have to, we actually have to kind of engineer our environment so that it actually works, so it can't teach. So how am I going to use this stuff? How do I make sure that it's actually, I can use this stuff? I need to make sure that in my environment that I'm teaching in, I have this universal design for learning concept happening where I'm saying to myself, when someone walks into my program, I'll have multiple ways content can be provided. How do my learners see, hear and read stuff? Is it just by this or are there other things that I can do? And when learners are in my environment, how do they act and express? How do they write stuff? Is it only with a QWERTY keyboard or pen and paper? Are there other ways that they can demonstrate their knowledge? And how does that sit with the formal assessment process? And those two things don't work unless I have multiple ways that I engage the learners that come into my program, the learners that you work with, that authentic learning environments. I need to be authentic about what I'm doing because I need to be, see a direct relation to who they are and where they're going. Um, so I'm, I've just come back from a week working in a remote Indigenous community where I had learners in a classroom. English was their third language nowhere remotely in, near their first two languages, and they were sitting in rows of chairs being instructed in English about Anzac Day. And while Anzac Day is an important concept they need to learn about, it's actually so many authentic learning opportunities need to be addressed in an environment. So I need to, need to think about that. So I need, to, I need you to think about that we often, what we'll do is we often will retrofit our environments and with this technology we need to prepare not repair the environment we need to be ready we need to be i need to be have my door open and i need to be ready to use this technology for whoever walks through my door